My 10-year-old blue and gold macaw banjo went from free flying on a Sunday to less than 70% of her body weight the following Wednesday, and it took us two weeks, four vets, and $3,000 in vet bills to figure out what was going on all over the Christmas holidays. Now you might think like I did that heavy metals are easy to avoid as long as you use safe toys, feed the right foods, and have the right aviary mesh. But you never know what is in our environment, so learn how my decades-long experience as a zookeeper and bird caregiver came in handy with this crazy health emergency. I will say that Banjo had laid her first egg one week prior. It was out of nowhere, no signs of reproductive behavior, and it was really weird. We were on alert for differences in her her behavior with the other macaws that she lives with, but we weren't looking for what would come next. My macaws live in outdoor aviaries and are trained free flyers, so when I noticed Banjo taking a nap one cold Monday afternoon in her aviary, I made a mental note that it was weird, but her training and care records didn't reveal anything unusual. The next afternoon, I saw it again when I was putting her up in her bedroom for dinner and sleepy time, and she felt a little bit lighter in weight, and her head and her overall feathers on her body were kind of fluffy. I was sure something was wrong, so we weighed her first thing the next morning. She had dropped from her usual hefty 1,125 grams to 825 grams. We called the vet and took her in immediately. While her x-rays weren't revealing, her blood work showed that Banjo had a high white blood cell account, revealing a possible infection, and a few other odd values that she, and that she was in kidney failure. So we started her on subcutaneous fluid therapy, antibiotics, and supplemental hand feeding formula to get her weight back up. First, I asked if they thought it was highly pathogenic avian flu because duh, that's the state of the world that we're in right now. My vet said no, that with as much certainty as he could, he didn't think it was likely that, given my location and her some symptoms, that she had avian flu. And second, I asked if this was metal toxicity. Her x-rays would have lit up if it were metal shards, he said. A few days later, she started vomiting some of her food. My vet agreed we should rush her to the emergency and specialty clinic over an hour away here in Southern California. I'll spare you the details of each interaction, but I do think it's important to note just how involved I was in, this, in these interactions. I have worked with vet clinics, zoo hospitals, and with wildlife rehabs. I have also like 30 birds, so I know my way around avian health as much as a non-technician can. I hesitated to go to this emergency clinic straight up for a few reasons. First, vomiting aside, Banjo was not in immediate distress, so I was going to go to my most trusted vet who knew me and my bird. Second, I don't love this emergency clinic and I probably won't go back unless I have very few other choices, and in my area, I do have other choices. I again asked this vet's opinion about avian flu and metal toxicity. They hypothesized that she could have gotten into something toxic, especially since she is an outdoor free-flying bird, but agreed that her radiographs would have lit up like a Christmas tree if there were metal. The main avian vet was going to be off for 10 days for his end-of-year holiday break, but assured me he had all of the confidence in the relief vet to take over the case, and they would contact him if Banjo needed further emergency care. I asked him specifically what that looked like, how would I know, and he said that if she was at the bottom of her hospital cage and having difficulty perching. He felt her prognosis was good for a bird that was so skinny, but otherwise chipper and strong. So this is a story about coordinating my bird's care with vets and sort of what that what went right and what went wrong, because I'm not blaming anyone for all of the hoops and thousands of dollars that we spent to finally get her diagnosis two weeks into Banjo's free fall of weight loss. But the way we got from point A to point B showed some stark dichotomies in the way that parrots and their people are treated. And I think that being your bird's advocate without questioning someone's credentials is really important. Feeling reassured that day, Banjo and I drove home after her second vet visit in as many days. Her weight continued to drop, and on the day before Christmas Eve, we contacted the specialty clinic again to check in about the results from the diagnostics we got. I waited for the relief vet to contact me at the end of that day. When they finally did, they explained to me, among many things, that the results of her diagnostics weren't great and that we should bring her in the following day, a Saturday, Christmas Eve, for follow-up blood work, and if she didn't so show any signs of improvement, we should talk about end-of-life care. 
whoa. <laughs> she really pushed hospitalization, which I refused. I'm confident in my ability to administer care to my birds, given me, my staff's, and my staff's experience, and the fact that my partner, Andre, has literally worked for one of the most famous zoo vet hospitals in the world for 15 years, caring for some of the craziest cases. I did not want to stress my bird out and jeopardize her health when the comfort of of in-home experienced care is known to have powerful effects on improving health. Now, I am not here to dig on vets, but I can tell you that as someone who is on the receiving end of that kind of advice, I should have immediately walked away from that. But again, it was the holidays and vet care was limited, and understandably so. For our Christmas Eve appointment, it was an extremely stressful day for Banjo. At that point, she weighed less than 800 grams. I could hear my bird shrieking long after her procedure was over, and I was crying and stressed. I felt so awful for her. But the news was good, if not confusing. Her kidney values were normal. Like what? I was so confused. The vet told me that Banjo was on the mend and I should taper off her fluids, her twice daily fluids, and that what I was doing was working. Basically, over the course of the next week, Banjo stayed strong, but we continued to watch her lose weight as we tapered her off of her fluids. I became frantic and we still didn't have a diagnosis. Finally, we decided to line up a CT scan as a last ditch effort and we brought her into the specialty clinic. I was reluctant, but I didn't know what else to do. She was losing as much as 10 grams a day and it was terrifying. I really didn't want to put my bird under anesthesia as her strength and skinny frame would not be able to handle it well. She wouldn't be able to eat or drink beforehand. Of course, as it turns out, Banjo did not get home until 5 p.m. and she plunged her head into her food bowl. I felt awful. I felt like I had really messed up, all to stay consistent with her care. The CT scan results did reveal damaged kidneys and they believed kidney disease such as fibrosis. They could not rule out mental toxicosis, but it didn't really seem like that was the case from the CT scan reader. Finally, I was able to secure an appointment with Dr. Attila Molnar up in Calabasas, who had taken my most difficult cases to before. By this time, any time Banjo so much as saw a person in scrubs, she started shrieking. My heart ached for her. He took a look at her records and believed she had metal toxicity. I asked why it wasn't caught in the radiographs and why other vets didn't believe she had metal toxicity, and he mentioned soluble metal toxicity, which we'll get to at the end. He overnighted her blood work off to a lab to check, but we started her on chelation therapy that day. He said she would need tube feeding for at least two to three weeks and that she had about a 50-50 shot of making it through this. She weighed 740 grams, yet we still drove her home three hours feeling relieved. The lab work came back, revealing a low level of zinc to toxicity. Banjo immediately began responding to the therapies gaining sometimes up to 25 grams a day. Chelation therapy involves intramuscular injections of a specialized drug cocktail intramuscularly twice a day. We also included fluid therapy to support her damaged kidneys. Now, if you know any one of these, whether it's tube feeding, intramuscular injections, or fluid therapy, you know how challenging these are. Put together all three, and it made for a really difficult process. You have to restrain your parrot and you really need to know what you're doing. It can be so terrifying knowing that you can kill your bird. You can kill your bird by aspiration, burned crop, and slow crop just through hand feeding, let alone gavage feeding. For a course on emergency and intensive care procedures that you can provide for your bird in coordination with your vet just like we did, check out the links in the caption. Now, like I said, this is not medical advice and it's meant to complement the vet care that you have with your veterinarian, just like we did. And if I didn't have this kind of training, I'm not sure my banjo would be where she is today. But what we have done with twice daily restraints with banjo is to make it really clear that we're going to restrain her and when we're there just to take care of her, weigh her and let her out if she is feeling up to it and basically anything but restrain. By keeping these two different interactions separate, we give her very clear communication and reduce everyone's step stress. She still steps up for me voluntarily every single day. I am also aware that my bird is in pain and doesn't feel well. It feels incredibly vulnerable for her at this point also. 
as caregivers, we want to make sure that we comfort them too. But to that extent, my needs are secondary to hers. So I wanna separate the comforting moments from the moments that I have to use restraint and force. I have found that my birds are much more likely to trust me and show less stress when they know exactly what I'm doing. When I need to restrain Banjo, I count down from five because I hate doing it. Then I go right in and restrain her. Then as soon as we're done and she wants to go back, I put her back. I don't make her sit with me and I don't tell her that it is okay. It is not. She is scared. Even if she was seemingly calm and quiet, I would still put her back right away. Birds express stress in three different ways, fight, flight, and freeze. Sometimes they simply go to mush because it is easier than trying to escape or bite us. I don't want to take advantage of this and use this as an opportunity to soothe my wounded heart. Instead, I will see if she has the energy another time for that. But I also know that she really needs rest and strength to heal. So if I can't use her as a teddy bear, that's okay too. Now, Banjo has been trained for many cooperative care procedures, such as towel restraints, nail trims, and taking yucky medication voluntarily through oral syringe training. At the beginning of this process, she took her oral meds really well. As time dragged on into the second and third week and she was getting more sick, it became clear that we needed to use more invasive techniques. This doesn't mean that our relationship is completely destroyed. This is where I believe our relationship that focus on communication and choice-based protocols has helped both of us respond to these changes. That doesn't always mean that we are perfect together. Ban Banjo isn't my pet bird. She doesn't live in my house and I don't even handle her every day. At Avian Behavior International, we do educational programs and training based on positive reinforcement. This means that while she is easily one of my favorite birds and we've been working together for 10 years, she also works with other trainers and spends a lot of time on her own and with other macaws. This makes our process through this time period truly a testament to what you can do with training through behavior science and recognizing the power of your interactions. It doesn't have to be hours spent a day, uh, each day working on your relationship. It can just be a few short minutes a week doing the right kind of training, the kind of training that builds mutually beneficial skills and increases communication and choice. So the big question is, how did Banjo get zinc toxicity? As of this filming, we are still trying to figure it out. Here's what we do know. First, zinc and other heavy metals are everywhere. They're in toys aviary wire, cage wires, food, the ground. Most of these items we give our parrots have zinc and they're often coated over with bird safe paints. So for instance, unless you have a purely stainless steel cage or aviary, yours has zinc. They're coated with paint to protect against zinc. The stuff you read on the internet about using vinegar isn't actually chemically accurate and it can promote rust, which is harmful. We use a water-based acrylic paint to paint over all of our aviary wire, but it does need regular touch-ups just like any paint job. What I have found talking about my story is that other caregivers have told me about their stories of parrots with metal toxicity uncovering sources that I never even thought of. Even bird-safe toy parts can have zinc. Metals that rust, even those that are nickel-plated, will have zinc, which you'll find in baffle cages and toy chains. Rubber-based toys can have zinc, Hardware can even have zinc and lead. Some pedicure perches have been found to have lead in their bases, leading to toxicities when ingested. Now second, Banjo is an outdoor free flyer that has extensive freedom allowed to her. She and other birds will hang out for hours and sometimes chew on all sorts of items that I have no control over. Thirdly, and this is important, Banjo is a 10-year-old bird and has lived among all of the above conditions for her entire life so something had to have changed. The only thing that we know that changed is that she had just laid her first egg, notably off season and without any kind of warning. So could her behavior changed and she started mouthing something that she wouldn't have normally, leading to what we call soluble heavy metal poisoning where no noticeable chips or flakes came off? This is our working theory and as it turns out, which came first, the metal toxicity or the egg is a really important question. Metal toxicity is really scary and there is no one way to treat it. I am not here to supersede any veterinary advice and all of the work that we are doing with Banjo is in coordination with our veterinary team. This is why having a good relationship with your vet is important. If you don't have one close to you, finding a veterinarian in your area, er, if you don't have one close to you, 
finding a veterinarian in your area that is willing to get on the phone and consult with veterinary experts is one that can get the necessary treatments that your bird can get the care that is needed and can mean the difference between life and death. If watching this makes you aware of the enrichment in your parrot's home space, even more so, check out my video on enrichment I would never give to my bird and subscribe for updates on Banjo's progress.